it sold for a lot less than I thought it was going to. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. It's time to do a little bit of a follow-up off of that Julian's auction when the Fool SG, that very iconic Eric Clapton guitar, came up for sale again. So if you need to learn more about the history, I briefly covered it in that episode. Just know it's one of his most iconic guitars and is definitely a symbol of the psychedelic era. I thought Gibson should bid to win on this, make custom shop recreations of it just like they did Greeny, store it in their vault for a year or two, and then sell it to somebody who will inevitably pay them more. But with an estimate of one to two million dollars, how much did it go for? Only 1.27 million. I really thought it was going to break their estimates, like three to four million. Now, apparently this has been sold a few times before, and some could argue that Clapton wasn't even the most famous user of this guitar. Seeing as this sold for half a million dollars before, it's definitely appreciated some in value, but now I know what you're thinking, who bought it? Well, according to Music Radar, nobody's surprised. The Jim Ursay collection. Obviously, it needed to go there if it's not going to go to Gibson. And who knows, maybe he'll still let Gibson borrow it and do all that. They just don't have to do the selling of it. But I can only hope one day we get a custom shop recreation of that guitar, because even if there's only 20 of them out there, it needs to be done. Some other recaps of the interesting guitars. The Slash Corvette Les Paul shattered what they thought it'd be. That's 26000 Now, you gotta remember, I don't think that has the buyer's premium worked in there. So all these things still sold for a lot. That's not bad for a funky looking Les Paul with a gig bag. But you guys remember that Minty 59? The quick recap, it was nothing necessarily special in the flame top department, but this was very well cared for. It's not all beat up. It's got some minor wear. I mean, the thing is very old, but it was estimated between 300 and 500,000. It broke it at 585,000. That's a lot of money, but it makes sense for the condition that it's in. I was really curious what this Albert King Flying V would go for. 63 and a half thousand. Definitely not surprised there. And I also wasn't surprised when this one didn't quite see the $20,000 price tag that they were hoping for. A Rick Nielsen owned and stage played Gibson Modern from the 80s. I still think it fetched quite a premium. People ask a lot for these, but two prototypes sat on reverb for a couple of weeks and I was heartbroken that I missed the price drop on them. They went for eight and a half thousand ish and Gibson, I think they sold their prototype for what, like around 20K. So they definitely liked that Rick, the master of crazy guitars owned it. That's our recap, let's get into the fun new guitars. So this weird prototype showed up on eBay back in October as the Doritos prototype guitar. We've talked about a lot of promotional guitars. Gibson did this in the late 90s to early 2000s. They still occasionally do it today, but that was the big era when they were pumping these things out for all the many different companies. But apparently Doritos wanted their own signature guitar. This one is really, really bad in my opinion. And I normally like these things. So our fretboard reads, Doritos presents three guitars. If it just said Doritos, I could get into it. But apparently this was a promotional guitar for a promotional event. So it's a promo of a promo. And then you've got the signs back here that says the three guitars. You got Clapton, Santana, and then I'll pretend to not know who this guy is. So you guys leave me lots of nice comments. But elements I do like about this is we've just got a doofy tortilla chip on our headstock. I dig that a lot. But apparently this was just in the Frito-Lay's office for a long time. Apparently it's not air conditioned or something that uh, who knows what this thing went through it's got finished checking up to wazoo but it actually works incredibly well so this is probably some sort of a graphic and just like on my nascar race car car guitars it splits over time as the wood moves and the finish doesn't but i've always loved this kind of vintage aesthetic doritos logo so mixing that with this and all the lacquer checking everywhere gives it a really cool vibe the only thing i don't like about this one really does come down to that fretboard all it needs is a good cleaning but i mean that's some extreme <laughs> spider web checking did they they intentionally age this because you don't normally see that much checking on a Les Paul. But they actually have some cavity shots in this eBay listing. And you can tell this was actually a chambered Les Paul due to the way that the route looks right here. Now it's not entirely clear to me, is this a carved top Les Paul or is it a flat top like most of these promos? This shot almost makes me think it's a carved top and if so, I regret not bidding on it because I thought it was an ugly flat top. So this is probably more so like a Les Paul Elegant, which makes me really sad because I passively collect those. 
And this is what I tell you guys, these promo guitars are not worth the crazy premiums people ask. In an open auction, when it has to sell, most people aren't going to pay more than a regular custom shop. This thing sold for $17.50. But the story behind this is apparently a guy worked at Frito-Lay for 37 years and was given this guitar upon his retirement. And it was some sort of a Super Bowl promotion in the early 2000s. I don't know why they're presenting three guitars rather than three guitarists, but apparently Gibson doesn't remember anything either. I can't blame him. Had I realized it was an elegant back then, I probably would have bought it and or bid more seriously. I hope whoever got that one enjoys it as is and we don't get another AMD refinish ruin all the history of the promo guitar situation. Speaking of vibes, look what showed up on Reverb one morning. It was listed as a 1996 Firebird. I like 90s Firebirds. So I decided to look at these photos and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's nice. It's blue. The further you get through the photos, you realize it's got a lot of finish checking. Now this thing's over in Japan, so maybe it wasn't stored quite properly. Generally, these Firebirds don't age quite that much. So that was a little bit of a red flag. Like, was this someone's bad refin attempt or did they intentionally try to age it? I believe this is just a finish check, but it could also be a filled in Kaler route. Then we flipped it over to the back. I could see the continuation of the aging. So at least it was consistent throughout. But then I got to the headstock photo and I was like, oh, that can't be a 1996. It's got a custom shop original decal on it. They stopped using those in 1994. So it has to predate that. This has to be from my favorite time period of custom color firebirds, the very early 90s. So sure enough, if you flip this around and look at your digits, it's a 1990. I'm like one of the few guys that actually collects these things. So I made them an offer. They declined. I was hoping I would get some sort of a counter, but instead of doing that, they declined and then uh, apparently someone else bought it. But to be fair, I much prefer the burst colors because they're a little bit more unique, but that was a pretty cool bird. Here's another one I'm a little bit sad I missed out on. Sellers. Send counter offers, because you never know how serious someone might be. That's my advice to you if you have something on reverb. Even if you get an offer that you think is just too low and you only want a discount of 50 bucks, send it anyway, because you never know. This is one of those situations where I wanted it for about 2000, but I probably would have paid his asking price if it really came down to it. Because I love these Gibson US ones. I like them when they're stop bar variety and I have not seen a two piece maple top. The only reason my offer was like 2000 is because we. We had three photos to go off of, and he said he was going to put some more later on. From this, I could tell the neck pickup has been replaced, but as we know from the documentation of the U2 and US1 series, those single coils die anyway, so I wasn't really that bothered by it, but that was a pretty good example. I liked it. But somebody bought it without waiting for the additional photos anyways. Here's another one I'm really fond of. So I have not documented the Vivian Campbell Les Paul Custom yet. It's a unique model from 2018. This one was priced about where they normally are. If anything, I think it was a little bit under, but the market's so soft lately. But that's one of the nicest tops I've seen on one of these. They called it Antrim Basalt Burst. This one has just such a wide flame top. It's one of the nicer ones I've seen. Get the interesting platinum colored pickups and bridge and tailpiece. Looks like they're even the locking style. And then this is one of the hand signed versions, number eight. And it's got the multi-piece maple neck that makes the run interesting. And then here's what your headstock looks like on them. It's like a must review, but unfortunately this listing has since ended. So I'm not sure if he sold it or decided not to let it go. But sadly, keeping a lot of guitars to have a museum people can visit has taken up a lot of my fun money. So I wasn't able to make an offer on this one before the seller ended the listing. So who knows? I'll keep it in my watch list just in case it comes back. And here's another one of those ones that I wish I would have bought. Here's a 1972 Les Paul Custom. How it sat on the market for multiple days at 5200, I have no idea. True 72s do not show up that often because they got the cool Gibson embossed pickup covers. This particular photo angle reminded me exactly of my Les Paul Custom stereo that we documented in this episode. The Cherry Sunbursts has aged in very similar ways. I mean, it's got the pancake body and all the other weird early 70s stuff to it. And maybe it doesn't look as good in these other photo angles, but this was still just a fantastic deal for a mahogany neck early 70s Les Paul Custom that appeared to be mainly original. I didn't see anything that stood out besides our strap buttons. And oh hey, I'm just seeing this for the first time. Our frets. 
<laughs> That's why it was such a good price. Man, now I feel foolish because I was like, am I missing something here? Now that I know it's been refretted, that's probably why I didn't have it priced at 7000 But I still wish I could have bought that to document it. That was well worth the money. And trust me, early 70s, got these tiny non-existent frets. <laughs> you want the refret on those. Then here's another one I'm sad I missed. I didn't think anybody else was going to click on it and figure out what it actually was. So it's listed as the Gibbs and Les Paul Supreme, but it sure doesn't really look like a Supreme over here. Because we, we don't have the Super 400 inlays, it looks like some sort of a Les Paul Modern. Then you get to the headstock, it's got a Les Paul Custom thing going on. But then this, 125th anniversary Les Paul Supreme case. Okay, that's a little bit strange. To go through this other stuff, it actually says Les Paul Supreme. And it's got some other case candy to it. But then when you get to the back, it's like, oh my goodness, it is a Supreme. Got the really nice back. And then it's also got a figured mahogany neck, which is unheard of. Then also the mahogany body itself is also figured. You never see that, especially when they had to chamber that poor puppy out. Then the serial number was 2021. The last real Supremes with the big chunk body stopped in 2019 when new ownership took over and that project got canceled so this is one of the last supremes ever made this got picked up by another dealer i i, I regret not just buying it because i would have happily kept it but the timing was just not right for me but apparently they made three supremes like this the other ones are actually this blue aqua color burst kind of like the goro yudo signatures and here they are at gibson so you know it's legit as far as we're aware right now those might have been the last full-bodied Supremes, at least for the near future. I really do think one day they could bring them back, but they'll be custom shop produced rather than Gibson USA. All right, Troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day, and you might even enjoy this next one.